Generative AI, like ChatGPT, has been getting better and better at math. But how good is it? I just copy and pasted my exams from last semester, this was a second year university level introductory linear algebra course, into ChatGPT and actually it got an A on my exams. But AI still makes a lot of pretty basic mistakes. I, I love this example where if you ask what is the smallest integer whose square is between 15 and 30, then both ChatGPT 4.0, Google's Gemini, and the recently released Claude 3.5, all of those give the answer of four because four squared is 16. But the smallest integer is negative five, negative five squared is 25. And all three are screwing it up. Now, one way that AI researchers measure how effective an AI is at math problems is they use these large data banks of questions. And there's a bunch of them. At the beginning, the most common one was known as GSM 8K for grade school math. And there were about 8,000 problems in this particular database. And all three of those large language models or LLMs managed to get, well, pretty close to 100% on this particular database. Now, this database consists of sort of arithmetic word problems. There's some easier ones and hard ones, but typically a middle school student should be able to get most of these problems. To give one example, a problem like this might be that Tina has three 12 packs of sodas, including herself, there are six friends at a party, half of the friends have three sodas, two of them have four, and one of them has five. How many sodas remain? It's a word problem involving arithmetic. And this is no longer challenging for the AI. All three of them are going to be able to do well on problems like these. And even my grade one kid, he's able to solve a problem like this. That wasn't always the case even a couple years ago, but it is the case now. There is a twist on the GSM database called GSM hard. And basically what it does is it keeps the exact same problem. So the same level of sort of arithmetic word problem reasoning. However, it adds in this overlay that the problems involved are all really big, large, random numbers. Now, generative AI are not computational engines, and actually doing this cuts the ability of the AI to solve these problems by about half, which is kind of interesting, because the only real difference is things that, like, a five-function calculator does. And, well, five-function calculators effectively always give you the right answer. They're designed to work that way. Now, a much more interesting way to make harder problems is not just to put big numbers in, but to make the reasoning in the problems harder and the level of mathematics more sophisticated. And this is what a database called, well, math uses. This is a database that, for example, Google DeepMind, when they're studying new techniques in Gemini, they're gonna be using this database to be able to measure their efficacy of their AI. This is high school level competition problems in this particular database. I want to show a couple examples from this database. I find them kind of interesting. The first is, well, it's an infinite sum of various cosine terms. You might like to pause the video and try to solve this for yourself, but actually ChatGPT nails this one. It recognizes a standard technique, which is geometric series. Geometric series have a particular sum. It finds a sum and it does some algebra and it uses a trigonometric identity to get the right answer. This requires a higher level of content knowledge, knowing the sum of a geometric series, knowing these trig identities, for instance. But the reasoning behind it is actually relatively straightforward applications of those ideas if you know them. Contrast that with the second problem here. In this problem, I want you to imagine you've got a three by three grid you are starting at a particular intersection at this particular point labeled A, and the question is if you can move up, down, left, or right, what's the probability that in only four moves you go all the way around that central square? Again, pause the video if you want to figure it out yourself, but the idea is not too hard. Basically it says, well, if I need to do it in four steps, I'm going to go clockwise or counterclockwise. If I go, say, clockwise, well, I have four options at each step, so to make those four steps exactly right, it's one-fourth to the power of four, or one in 256. Because there's clockwise or counterclockwise, it's one in 128. That's the method. ChatGPT 4.0 solves this problem. However, Gemini and Claude 3.5 both struggle with it, which is kind of interesting. That isn't always the case over this math uh, database that we're talking about. Well, Gemini typically gets about 68% of them, Cloud 3.1 maybe 71, and ChatGPT 4.0 is the best at 77%.
What I find interesting about this problem is that this problem doesn't necessarily take higher level content knowledge. There's no fancy geometric series needed, for example, in this problem, but it does take a little bit more mathematical reasoning, and that is a spot where the LLMs can fall down. And then there are higher level data sets as well. For example, there's a collection of problems that are at the mathematics Olympia level, which are, are very hard problems, specifically taken from the American Imitational Mathematics Examination. And on these, all of the LLMs are doing really, really poorly. However, I actually did see a new paper coming out that was sort of a, a hybrid between a large learning model as well as sort of more traditional Monte Carlo tree search. And, and it was actually managing to get from about 2% up to about 12% on these extremely challenging problems. And by the way, that was actually on a small and open uh, LLM called Llama, as opposed to sort of the big uh, corporate but, but closed ones like ChatGPT. And I've seen other data sets as well. For example, some that are asking like third year topology and real analysis problems. It depends where you go. But I feel like the Math One high school competition where they're getting around 70% right now is a good indicator of where their math skills are at at this moment. Now, you might be wondering if these large language models are getting around 70% on the high school competition problems, how are they able to do the same or even a little bit better on my university level math tests? They do perform quite a bit worse, by the way, on homeworks. And I think part of the reason here is that while my homeworks at the university level are often a little bit more involved, they take some reasoning, there's multiple steps to them. When I write a test, I typically have my tests being relatively straightforward to the learning objectives that they're meant to do. So if I ask students to prove that the null space is a subspace or that a particular set of vectors is linearly independent. Now, if you don't know what those words mean, those might be higher level than a high school problem. However, the test problems I put on the test are relatively standard and relatively straightforward. So if you think about something like ChatGPT with its massive training database scraping the internet, it's gonna see a huge number of problems that are of the form prove something or other is a subspace. It's gonna know what the steps are. It's gonna be able to see how to do that and it does a good job of being able to replicate it. And this maybe connects all the way back to that earlier problem about the smallest integer whose square is between 15 and 30. There's a lot of problems out there that use that kind of structure, but they might be looking at the smallest integer and we're not considering the case of negative integers. There's something in the reasoning there where it's a little non-standard to be considering those cases that somehow trips everything up. I also find that one of the larger learning outcomes that's challenging for my linear algebra students in particular is they're learning just the basics of how to write simple mathematical proofs. And that can be quite hard for a student seeing it for the first time. But because it's writing an exposition based and some of the grades are associated with that, that's actually something where ChatGPT excels at. And so sometimes they'll do better at that than my own students will. And so the large language model's ability to, to generate correct answers isn't necessarily a function of like how high up the learning objective is on a traditional like academic hierarchy and more about how much reasoning involved in the problem, how standard versus non-standard it is. The more non-standard it is, the less they have it well established in the training data. Those are typically the math problems that perform a little bit worse for the large language models. Now, it is worth noting that we have a lot of really, really powerful math tools out there. For example, the three sort of general mathematics suites of software are provided by Maple and uh, Wolfram's Mathematica and MATLAB. And all three of these can do crazy things like analytic integration and highly effective at doing numerical estimates and computations, plotting graphs. They have a huge number of features and for many mathematicians are an indispensable tool in their mathematics and their mathematics research. These are primarily computational engines. They don't make the simple mistakes that you know, multiplying numbers or executing an algorithm that a large language model will do. They have very different purposes and they're designed in different ways. There's also some approaches to try to combine these. So for example, Wolfram and ChatGPT have a collaboration together where you can use ChatGPT and it helps spit out the code that goes into Wolfram and generates really nice plots. There's a lot of cool things coming out. Now, I am recording this video about halfway through 2024, and so I am predicting this is gonna be one of my most obsolete videos in a couple of years. I'm not an AI researcher myself, I just read lots of papers about it, and so I don't have a really good sense of how fast this is likely to evolve. Like, how long until the math database is solved at the 
97% accuracy that the grade school level ones are. How long until an, an LLM can ace, well, like an upper year undergraduate course? How long until it's really useful in math research and proving theorems? And then regardless of how good it gets, like what are the social implications? How does it affect our learning? How does it affect jobs? How does it affect what we're planning to do in universities? There's a lot of big questions there. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna try to answer one of them. Like how can we learn effectively given all these tools that we have in 2024 in, in a coming up video? But a lot of these questions are gonna have to wait and see until we see some more results coming out in the future. Now, if you wanna learn more about neural networks behind the AI that I've been talking about in this video, I'd strongly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is brilliant.org. All of Brilliant's thousands of lessons break down the big ideas into digestible chunks building up complexity in layers so that by the time we've built up to say a neural network that actually predicts what shape you've drawn, you understand every step along the way about how that neural network is actually built. Everything is really interactive and full of quick tests of your knowledge to make sure that you are understanding everything. As a professor, I know that this kind of student-centered active learning is really effective for your learning and that's why I am so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. To try everything that Brilliant has for free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bassett. That's me and the link is down in the description. And you can also click that link to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd love to hear how you're using AI in your learning of mathematics. Leave those down in the comments and we'll do some more math in the next video.